Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Russ Yarrow, member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, General Manager of Corporate Relations at Chevron, and your chair of the program. You'll find the Commonwealth Club on the web at commonwealthclub.org. Tonight's program is another in a series called Innovating California, a partnership between the Commonwealth Club and Chevron to explore solutions to some of the most critical issues facing California. Our focus tonight is the California economy and how we can build a path for growth and prosperity going forward. We're fortunate to have an excellent panel whose collective knowledge of the California economy is indeed a mile wide and a mile deep. To begin the discussion and to introduce our panel, it's my pleasure to welcome our distinguished moderator, Ross Duvall. Ross is Chief Research Officer at the Milken Institute, where he leads the Institute's work in job creation, health, and capital access. He's an appointee to the California State Controller's Council of Economic Advisors and is ranked among the superstars of think tank scholars by International Economy Magazine. Prior to joining the Institute, Ross was Senior Vice President of Global Insight, the widely respected economics forecasting firm where he supervised the Regional Economics Services Group. Ross holds a master's degree in economics from Ohio University and received advanced training in economics at Carnegie Mellon. Now I'm pleased to turn the program over to Ross. Well, thank you very much, Russ, but you shouldn't have used that introduction that my wife had written for you. Uh, she's encouraged me to keep that superstars of think tank scholars in my bio. Uh, as we begin our discussion, what I believe will be a fascinating aerial and on the ground view of the vast and diversified California economy, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, first beside me is John Chung. He was first elected um, controller in November of 2006 for the state of California, the ninth largest economy in the world. Uh, he was elected to serve a second term in November of 2010. Uh, John has received praise for making the state's finances more transparent and accountable to the public. Uh, the controller's aggressive audits have identified more than $3 billion uh, that were denied, overpaid, or subject to collection. He has led efforts to reform the state public pension system and help lo local governments navigate hard economic times and launch financial and tax assistance seminars for California's working families, seniors, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations. Please join me in welcoming John. Um, Peter Griebley is the Executive Vice President and Regional Manager for the Wells uh, Fargo Regional Commercial Banking Office here in San Francisco. He manages commercial banking professionals who provide loan, treasury management, and deposit products to companies with annual sales of greater than $20 million throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Peter joined Wells Fargo in 1989. That would make him younger than me. He worked for three years as a relationship manager in the real estate construction group and has more than 18 years in commercial banking, working in various offices throughout California. Please join me in welcoming Peter. <laughs> Next is Joel Kotkin, an internationally recognized authority on global economic, political, and social trends. Described by the New York Times as America's uber geographer, that might be better than Superstar, I think. Yeah. For over 30 years, uh, Mr. Kotkin has been one of the nation's most prolific and widely published journalists. His most recent book, The Next 100 Million, America in 2050, explores how the nation will evolve over the next four decades. Over the past decade, Joel has completed studies focusing on several major cities, including London, Mumbai, Mexico City, New York, Los Angeles, Houston, St. Louis, and many more. Uh, Mr. Kotkin is currently distinguished professional, presidential, excuse me, not professional, presidential fellow in Never urban, professional. yeah, and professional as well, <laughs> in urban futures at Chapman University in California. Please welcome uh, Joel. <laughs> and last but not least, when K is the last in the uh, lineup for the alphabetical order, Ro Khanna, was born in Philadelphia, a city that I spent a good deal of my career at 
Wartnikon Metrics at the University of Pennsylvania. Had to get that plug in, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, he recently returned to his home in Northern California after spending two years working for the Obama administration uh, as Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Commerce Department. In this capacity, he managed 108 domestic commerce offices that help companies export and innovate. Uh, during his time in the Obama administration, he also was named to the White House Business Council. In this capacity, he held meetings with business and labor leaders across the country and advocated for policies to strengthen America's competitiveness in a global economy. Prior to his service in the administration, he was an intellectual property attorney and is currently of counsel at the law firm of Wilson, Sosini, Goodrich, and Rosati, where he specializes in representing high technology companies. He is also a visiting lecturer in the Department of Economics at Stanford University and author of the book Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Nation, Why Manufacturing is Still Key to America's Future. Please join me in, in welcoming Roe. Thank you. John, allow me to begin the discussion with you, and I'll throw you a softball uh, to start this off. You've been in the middle of one of the biggest challenges confronting not only the nation, but here in California as the epicenter of state fiscal problems. A number of extraordinary measures have been taken to tackle the state's fiscal mess. Uh, progress has been made, but California's budget remains, unfortunately, billions of dollars in the red. Could you give us some perspective on where we have been and where we're at today in addressing California's fiscal crisis? Uh, thank, thanks, Ross. Uh, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club for this opportunity to participate. Uh, to answer your question, let me go back to year 2008-2009. Uh, in 2008, we were watching the material deterioration of the financial sector here in the United States of America. We were experiencing commodity price increases uh, uh, throughout quarters. We had Bear Stearns go under uh, or file for bankruptcy uh, in the spring of that year. And the California legislature and governor were unable, as too, too often occurred, unable to come to agreement on a budget. So we saw the bankrupt, we saw the, uh, we saw Lehman Brothers go under, and a, about a week later, we saw uh, California finally come to grips with its budget. Governor Schwarzenegger signed a budget in excess of $100 billion. Uh, some of you saw the disagreements that I publicly had with the governor because I said that budget was far too generous. Uh, in fact, the state of California that year, even though we signed a $103 billion budget, collected $87.8 .8 billion. That was one of four years where we had substantial uh, budget issues, and that led to further problems. So come January of that year, I had warned all of you, the taxpayers of California, that in the absence of urgent action by the governor and legislature, I was going to have to take action that was going to be incredibly unpopular among the populace of California. Why? Because I had $2.7 billion remaining in the state treasury, but I had $10 billion worth of bills to pay. I didn't want California to take the course of Greece or some of the other European nations that were starting to default on their debt obligations. Uh, California also has additional wrinkles and complications because we are one of the 38 states that do take on debt, but we're the only state that places education payments as the top priority payment ahead of debt service. And clearly, we're trying to stay as far away as possible from debt service. The governor and legislature came to agreement, but their budget did not work, so I was faced with the ignominy, our state, of having, having to issue IOUs to prevent all of us from going to court in August of 2009. Uh, so the state's cash position was incredibly weak. Uh, in fact, July 13, 2007 is the last state California, from a cash perspective, or it's the first state California, from a cash perspective, has operated in deficit. So for that period of time, California, as Ross indicated, the world's ninth largest economy with a $1.9 plus trillion dollar state domestic product has been operating on other people's money. Uh, we are starting to correct the course of the ship. Uh, Governor Brown, uh, with the legislature, is rapidly decreasing the misses on the budget, but we have a long, long way to go. And so we have considerable uh, cash tension and we have considerable budget tension for the foreseeable future. Thank you, John. We've made a lot of progress, but we're going to get back to what we need to do to really fix the fiscal crisis, if there is such a thing a little later. Uh, Joel, if I could turn to you next, 
you've been doing a lot of work uh, on the middle class and looking at changing demographics and economic and sociological dimensions. Let's focus on how California is doing in regards to the middle class. Uh, I can't be more direct than this. Is there a future for middle class jobs in California? Well, I'm not sure there's, there's a great future. The, the past 10 years have been pretty miserable. Um, we've, lost, uh, uh, we've lost not only a lot of jobs, but we've been particularly hit, hard hit in what you call mid-skilled jobs. In other words, jobs for people with uh, two years uh, education after high school. Uh, we've done very poorly compared to other states, notably Texas. Uh, we've also, um, in the area of STEM jobs, um, we've also underperformed. Even today, Silicon Valley um, has not really recovered from where it was in 2000. Um, and that's in, in the midst of a bubble, which we're in right now. Um, but more importantly, I think, is that, that there isn't enough money to be made in Silicon Valley to make up for everything else that's going on. And a vast swaths of this state are in terrible shape. Um, large parts of Los Angeles County, large parts of the Inland Empire, places where middle class people went to buy houses. Um, the industrial base is, is much weaker than it was. LA County itself has been one of the biggest losers of industrial jobs over the last decade. Uh, San Francisco, by the way, has also been pretty high. Um, so the basis for a middle class is being eroded over time. Um, and the basically the statistics will show you that um, we have become a more bifurcated society than the national average. And, and the country is not, nothing to, to write home about, believe me. Um, this divide in California now between a relatively small, very affluent population and a growing population that's really pretty much dependent on whatever kind of transfer payments they can get or living very minimally. I, I would ask you if you ever drive down to Southern California, I know San Franciscans hate to even think of that, but um, uh, if, if you ever did, um, drive down Highway 33 and you will see something that looks like Mexico on a bad day. Um, I mean, there is unbelievable levels of deterioration and poverty. Um, I, and, but I don't have to go to Highway 33. I live in the San Fernando Valley, and I, can, I don't have to go very far to see huge abandoned shopping malls or to see uh, empty factories. You, you drive along the industrial belt of LA, and it's basically empty. The factories are just gone. They're, um, there's nobody in the parking lots. Some of them have been turned into malls. So until we uh, basically um, bring back our basic industries, and I think we may agree on this, manufacturing, um, energy, um, I, you know, California has got more oil and gas perhaps than any state in the union, but we're too good to use it. Um, uh, fundamentally, um, we, don't, if we don't bring back those basic industries, manufacturing, um, we're losing a lot of, uh, on the warehousing side. What is the opportunity for the middle class in the state? I mean, basically, they're not going to be working for Facebook. Um, and at the same time, even in the tech sector, many of those middle class jobs, um, the very high end jobs may be here, but the middle class jobs are going elsewhere. All I ask you to do is go, one last thing, go, if you go to Salt Lake City, and you, b before you go skiing, uh, go down Highway 15, and you will see one gigantic California company after another who are providing very good jobs for people in Utah. Uh, this just can't go on forever without having some enormous rip in our social fabric. And as somebody who uh, covered and witnessed the 1992 riots in LA, uh, I'm very concerned about this in the long run. And I think it's the biggest problem facing California in the next 10 to 20 years. So one might call it the threat of a barbell economy, strong on yes. both ends, the high and the low end without much in the middle. Um, Ro, let's stick with uh, manufacturing. Uh, you talk about the importance of manufacturing a great deal uh, in your book, and you take on many of the critics that say the U.S. should just focus on knowledge-intensive service sectors and leave manufacturing for other low-cost countries. Could you explain why you think they're wrong? Well, some of the critics, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, Robert Reich, uh, prominently uh, simply get some of the statistics wrong. Uh, they assume that all manufacturing has gone offshore. Uh, what's remarkable is despite uh, the currency manipulation and what I would argue cheating of the Chinese regime, 
uh, we are still neck and neck in manufacturing. We produce about 20% of the world's goods uh, with 10% of our economy. Uh, China produces about 20% of the world's goods with 40% of its economy. Uh, we have a six times productivity advantage over China, uh, twice the productivity advantage even over Germany and Japan. And I agree with Joel that manufacturing is basic to our economy for a number of reasons. One, uh, you can't balance the trade deficit without growing the manufacturing base. Uh, it's, uh, as the President Clinton would call it, arithmetic. You can't uh, keep innovation here if we don't have manufacturing here. And I think the biggest misconception is that somehow manufacturing jobs are unskilled jobs. And what I tell people is, you could say a lawyer is unskilled. I mean, most of the day, you go, you cut and paste documents, you add a little bit, and then you bill the clients. I mean, that, I, I don't know how or, creative that is. a couple of times you bill the clients. <laughs> you know? so, so, so there are manufacturing jobs. You've got to operate CNC machines. You have to operate uh, complex programming. And these are high-skilled, thoughtful, creative jobs. And uh, as a society, uh, we need to recognize their value. Well, thank you very much, Ro. Um, <clears throat> Peter, you sit in a unique position to be able to observe economic conditions not only in the San Francisco Bay Area, but compared to other regions of the state. I mean, what are you seeing from your customers in the Bay Area versus how your customers in other parts of the state see things? Yeah, thank you, Ross. Welcome, um, it's a very um, diverse mix that we see. I, I think San Francisco has shown um, a fair recovery over the last 12, 18 months. There has been job creation in California. In fact, we've had uh, about 270,000 jobs since the bottom of the trough, maybe June uh, of 2010 or so. So there has been increase in jobs throughout the state of California. But as Joel mentioned earlier, where are those jobs and what are they touching? What areas of focus are those jobs in? Where we're seeing some growth in San Francisco specifically is uh, an opportunity is clearly there is the growth of the, the, the tech, the social media aspect of things. There's the biotech area here in Dogpatch. Construction is also uh, a significant growth area. It's been up about 2.9 percent over year over year. And you see that as you came in today to try and cross Howard Street and see what was going on. Uh, the Transbay Terminal, the, the Bay Bridge, the Caldecott Tunnel. So clearly there are, uh, there is growth that is occurring. The challenge that I'm seeing with our customers is it's almost like they're waiting for the next piece of bad news. And a lot of our customers that we have been dealing with over the last number of years since, since 2008 have really built up their balances of cash, not really interested in making that big capital spend. Yes, they are spending, but it's more on a technological basis. It's the soft dollar costs and the things that may make them more efficient, but as far as making more products or building that machine, it's not something that I've seen, at least in our customer base, as much of. Now going broadening outside of the San Francisco Bay Area, I think that there's some growth that is occurring clearly in some of the larger metropolitan areas throughout California. San Jose, Silicon Valley area, Orange County, Los Angeles, San Diego, those are areas of growth uh, and have seen job growth in those areas. Central Valley is much more challenged and the recovery is much slower. And so while we have seen growth in the amount of loans that have been provided throughout the state over the last 24 months, there are certain areas within the state that have clearly not had the speed and rapidity of the growth that we have seen here in San Francisco and definitely with my colleagues that work in the Southern California region. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Let's stick with manufacturing for just a while longer and what some might tout as kind of the new clean, green tech jobs uh, in the manufacturing sector, including alternative energy. Um, Joel, let me start with you. Uh, a lot of people have touted these sectors as a way to create middle class jobs in the future. How many of these jobs do you think will end up being in California? There's a lot of investment going into these sectors, but are, are the jobs going to stay here? Well, it would seem to me that manufacturing is manufacturing um, uh, and, and the, I think it's going to be very difficult for people to do manufacturing green or otherwise um, in California under the current circumstances. Um, 
Uh, secondly, many of these green jobs are very heavily subsidized by ratepayers, taxpayers, and um, I don't know how long that goes on. I mean, the um, you know, I think that you're already seeing um, some some serious problems in the solar sector and in the in the wind sector. Um, so um, I mean, I, I think that the, I think this has you know some limitation. The other thing is that because of the policies California in particular has, we have very very high energy costs. And I just was you know not to tout Utah, but I was just there recently. Um, gigantic Intel factory, which is something every American should be proud of. They build the, the leading. They've won all the awards on flash memory. It's a 1,600 people working there, a half mile long factory in, in Lehigh, Utah. Great jobs, love to see it in California. The, the, CE, uh, the CEO, who actually is originally from Iran, um, said there's just no way in the world they could do that in California, that the electricity cost is too high, the electricity supply is too unreliable. Um, you can't afford to have electricity go out in a semiconductor plant. Um, and these are great jobs, as Ro mentioned, very high-skilled manufacturing jobs, and they bring in a lot of the um, the design functions are integrated into the rest. So, you know, I think California has really, you know, allowed the manufacturing um, economy to deteriorate. Again, when we did a, a ranking for Forbes on manufacturing jobs over the last decade. Uh, two of the worst um, areas in terms of loss of jobs were Los Angeles and San Francisco uh, in the manufacturing side. So, you know, if we don't get that going, I think we're going to see more um, losses. And I think, as Rose suggested, a lot of the ancillary services that are connected to manufacturing also will, will go because manufacturing generates lots of opportunities for uh, advertising, PR, even lawyers, um, uh, <laughs> accountants, business services in general. We've seen very strong business service growth, for instance, in Seattle, which has the advantage of both having a real tech economy, not based on social media bubble, but and also has an enormous um, uh, manufacturing sector built around the what we used to have here in aerospace, and that's just driven business service growth as well. Well, one other factoid. Um Intel now, now has more employees in the state of Oregon than it has in the state of California. So, yeah, that's been going on for a number of years. Ro, let me turn this to you. Let's not be too pessimistic. So I need, need some optimism from you. Well, I'm hoping well, you might see things a little bit differently. How, how can California create manufacturing jobs and take advantage of the, glean, the clean tech, the green alternative energy sector? Can it be done here? Absolutely. First, I agree with Joel that I think we need to look at manufacturing uh, more broadly as advanced manufacturing, not uh, single out uh, a particular uh, technology. Right. Uh, but then I think what we, what we need is regional uh, efforts uh, mm -hmm. to make the business climate hospitable for manufacturing. I uh, see uh, Dale Kay from Innovation Tri-Valley in the audience. And what uh, Innovation Tri-Valley is doing is saying, look, California has some natural uh, advantages, resources. We've got the national laboratories. We've got great community colleges like Cal State East Bay and Las Positas. We're a, na a nation and a state of immigrants. We've got a, such incredible uh, talent and uh, uh, diversity. So how do we take these natural advantages we have and make the most of them? Well, we've got problems. We've got uh, permitting problems where businesses are having to deal with complex bureaucracies. We have mm -hmm. problems of tax incentives. We have problems with uh, people not graduating with the right skills. And my hope and my belief is that regional organic solutions to this are going to be more effective uh, than letting uh, Sacramento or even Washington try to fix the problems. I think we need these regional uh, institutions to step up and, and uh, have change and understand the underlying strengths that the California economy has. Very good. Thank you, Ro. Uh, John, Peter, anything else to add on manufacturing? Yeah, I, I, a couple of things. Number one, I think we have to have a catchment approach. The, uh, we really have to make government much more efficient. So I have a friend who owns the largest shrimp importing company he, here in the state of California, and he has to comply with four different government agencies, uh, most of it health related. So obviously, we ought to integrate those functions, have all those agencies working together, time it properly so that he can reduce his administrative costs in terms of compliance with government. Secondly, uh, and this is a huge, huge obstacle, 
we really have to update California's tax code. Now, this is a political issue. Uh, so it's ch challenging the institutional forces and the tax credits that have been built in for the greater interests of all California. Our fr franchise tax authority, so the income taxes, corporate taxes, fr franchise taxes was created in 1929 in the state of California. Our sales taxes was created in 1933 based on industrial-based economy on, and the impetus or the obligation occurs on the transfer of tangible personal property title or transfer of tangible personal property. That has a create, creates a tremendous disincentive for manufacturing activity here in the state of California. And then if you look at corporate tax apportionment methodology, and let me pose this question, how many of you can describe California's corporate tax apportionment methodology? Raise your hand. Right, obviously we have a tax issue when we can't have an educated audience understand how taxes work in California, especially for corporations. So it is a massive hurdle for all of us to try to fix it. And when you only have a few people, the, your response is not different than most of the legislators' response, and that's problematic. So our tax incentive, our tax corporate tax apportionment methodology encourages people to hire people and to open up shop outside the state of California. So when Rick Perry says I'm coming and taking California jobs, Rick, you don't even have to come here. Just look at our tax formula and we say we will ship jobs to Singapore, India, China, Texas, South Carolina. So that is something we have to address and the sooner the better. Uh, amen to that, John. Uh, Peter, anything else on that topic? No, I mean, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from John because I sure as heck don't know what the tax code is and I don't wanna try and figure it out. Uh, but, but going back to the, the perspective of you know, manufacturing jobs and if you start focusing more on green energy and, and technology and from a banking perspective, there's clearly an interest and a support to try and assist our customers in those areas. Um, we have allocated and have actually lent uh, over $1.6 billion towards wind, wind energy over the last five years. Uh, $11.5 billion has been uh, lent to customers for uh, uh, green and efficient lead energy buildings. And so there is an interest for us to support our customers, but whether or not they're in a, in a friendly enough state uh, so that they can take advantage of the, the financing that's available to them, is there, is there an interest, is there a tax uh, uh, ability for them to move forward on these projects is really the question. Is it going to be affordable? Is it efficient for them? And is it something that is sustainable uh, for them in order to complete the projects? And that's the biggest challenge. And if we're going through a process where it's very difficult to get entitlements to move forward and actually complete the construction process and how long will it take and how inefficient will it be by the time you actually do complete it, those are some of the challenges that are faced by our clients. And so so I, I would say that there's always going to be a willingness to support uh, various industries and various um, manufacturing opportunities. It is more of a question as to whether or not the businesses are going to take on that challenge because of what they perceive might be an ineffective uh, business climate. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Today we're discussing California's prospects for economic recovery and what this also bodes for the rest of the nation. Our panelists are John Chung, controller of the state of California, Peter Griebley, executive vice president of commercial banking for Wells Fargo, Joel Kotkin, distinguished presidential fellow in urban futures at Chapman University, and Ro Khanna, visiting lecturer in the Department of Economics at Stanford University and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the Obama administration. And I'm Ross Duvall, Chief Research Officer at the Milken Institute. Let's move to the social media now. We've talked about manufacturing. Uh, social media startups, IPOs have been thriving here in the Bay Area. Um, it has been, the industry has been hiring programmers, developers, engineers at a rapid pace absorbing most of those with the requisite skills in the region. Um, the question really is, how sustainable is the social media business model? Is it gonna be able to keep hiring the best and brightest, or are those expectations too high? Uh, Joel, my guess is you might have a perspective on this. Maybe I could start with you, and then we can get some reaction to that. Well, you know, um, I think social media um, reminds you know of the last uh, dot com boom. I happen to have been working um, 
as an advisor to a venture capital firm. And let me put it this way. I've seen this movie before, and it was better the last time. Um, you know, I think that, that clearly there, you know, some of these companies will survive and some of them may thrive over time. I think a lot of them will disappear. They won't be here in five years. A lot of them will be absorbed into other, other companies. There is a tendency in technology, um, particularly in the software side, for oligopolies to form very, very early. Um, I don't know if there is any answer to that, but, but it certainly um, is happening. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, Peter was mentioning to me, you know, projection 5,000 tech jobs. Tech from, biotech, right. Uh, 5,000 jobs a year for the next 10 years. I don't know how you could possibly project that. Um, I mean, the bottom line is I think the social media boom has probably already hit its peak and it's probably going to start to come back. The, the problem is you just, get, you know, a lot of these businesses don't make any money. I mean, at, at some point, you got to make money. One of the things about a manufacturing business or even a business like Amazon, which is selling a product, you can sort of see where the money comes from. I don't see where Farmville, I don't see where the money comes from. <laughs> I mean, I just, I can't quite get it. Um, and I think that well, we will see a lot of companies go under. I think a lot of the coupon companies <clears throat> are history because it's an easy thing for a store to do or for Amazon to do. Um, I just think there's a lot of money sloshing around the system. You know, Uncle Ben keeps printing it and, uh, uh, and it's got to go somewhere and obviously you're not going to put it in a CD. So people are looking for high return. But fundamentally, um, I mean, I think, I think it, it will be a factor. It will not be a driver of, of the economy um, going forward for the next 10 years. Um, and I think that we um, have to, um, I think that the assumption that it or green energy was going to save us is part of this great delusion that California's leaders continue to repeat over and over again. And I guess they feel like it's sort of a mantra. If they keep repeating it, it will come true. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the way the world works. Okay, so is it the next dot-com boom? My guess is others, uh, or bust, boom and then bust. Um, any other, Ro, what do you think? What it, what's it look like? Well, I, I don't think it's going to be a panacea of creating middle-class jobs, but I think it's important to understand the role uh, that social media is playing uh, for our nation and for the world. I mean, if you look at the founding of the country, founded on principles of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, of freedom of press, and what is Twitter and Facebook, what they're doing is allowing uh, individuals all over the world to have those basic rights. And you now can, it can be a dissident in Iran or a dissident in China. Now, some of these governments are uh, censoring the internet, but suddenly uh, it's much tougher for the government to lie to you. It's much tougher for the government to deprive you of uh, information. We used to spend uh, millions of dollars on Voice of America radio as a nation to, to defeat the Soviet Union, and now we have uh, social media, which is projecting the best of American ideals around the world. So I, I think we have to look at social media uh, also in the, in the perspective of what it has to offer for spreading our ideals, for creating innovative jobs, and, and a central part of the economy. Of course, it's not going to be a panacea for creating middle class jobs. We also need a manufacturing base. We also need a strong service sector. But I, I do think it has a, a real impact uh, in the economy and a positive impact uh, for, for social change. Uh, Peter, any, any comments on the um, IPO of Facebook and maybe that kind of in the post-Facebook IPO, that that's where this negativism is, is coming from? Yeah, I mean, clearly it was, it was underwhelming as far as the performance after. Uh, or you could say that Facebook knew how to price it right, right. to begin with, so good for them. Um, because often you're going to see uh, IPOs come out and, and significant changes in price, but we just don't generally see that being a decrease in price. So that is... Um, you know, problematic, but I don't think that it really is an indictment of the social media as it stands. I mean, there is a place for it, and, and clearly it is something that has become part of a lot of uh, people's everyday lives. Uh, I do agree, though, with Joel that, you know, this is very much like the bubble that I felt in the, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s with the Internet. Uh, boom and then bust and and in reality clearly social media has been a significant driver in the growth of the local uh, economy in Sil Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area 
But the other factor is, is where are the jobs going to be long term? And, and whether or not these are going to be, you know, a thousand social media companies or is it going to be five social media companies and are those jobs going to be in California or are they going to be in Austin or are they going to be in Utah or are they going to be in Portland and I think that is really a, a, an outlying factor that needs to be considered I don't see this as something that is going to be a, a significant job uh, creator for a long-term basis. It might be on a short-term basis here, especially in the Bay Area for the next two to five years, maybe not that long. But definitely outside of that, I don't necessarily see that as a driver going forward. Well, thank you, Peter. Before I turn to some audience questions, I want to try and just tie this in, the social media, to the outlook for the fiscal situation of the state. Uh, John, you've talked to legislators over the past few months as well as I have. Uh, many of them have been looking for the Facebook IPO and other social media IPOs to be the panacea and are already planning on how they could spend those tax revenues. I mean, what, it, what did you think legislators were assuming in terms of the tax collections that might come in from the social media and all the IPOs versus what might actually transpire? Well, clearly they need to be cautious. Uh, so the Legislative Analyst Office and the Department of Finance both did reviews of uh, what they believe would happen with Facebook. Uh, they have different prices uh, at certain t uh, points in time by which they believe the <coughs> stock price would have appreciated to, one at 35, the other one at 41. So the expected tax revenues uh, that were determined or identified if that had occurred would have been between $1.9 billion and $2.1 billion through the 2013 tax season. So obviously, uh, depending on what takes place, and it's a, it's a larger factor with the November elections, especially in regards to taxes, what's happening with mid-year tax collections from other sources of income. And up to this point in California, we're only 41, below, 41 million below uh, current budget estimates, which is basically a rounding error. Uh, we will see what happens with the triggers uh, in the right. event these things fall short. Well, let's turn to some questions from the audience. They probably can do a better job than I have. Um, well, let's stick with a budget question here. This is a bit long, but let's get to it quickly. The most pressing economic concern for California seems to be the liabilities currently held by the state in the under and unfunded pension obligations. What do you predict or advise? What can we do to manage that problem? And what do you think the impact will be on California in the next five to 10 years? And you can answer that in 10 seconds or less. Anyone? <laughs> Maybe John has some ideas on it first? Sure. So we know that the, uh, there was a legislati legislative package that was uh, just signed by, the gov signed by the governor, passed by the legislature. The governor had offered over a year ago a 12-point uh, legislative package. Uh, it is a strong start. Um, we obviously have to keep track of what the additional obligations are going to be. Uh, now, the big question is, can you cut into current uh, workers' pensions? Uh, under a California constitutional case, those are vested rights. Uh, some people are going to challenge those rights. So the thing is, looking at the financial positions of the various jurisdictions. So CalPERS, you have to understand, it's not only the state, but it has tons of local agencies. Uh, and so you have to look at all those various plans and then aggregate them. You need action by all the relative agencies and parties so that we can try to get uh, a better grip on the pension issue. Uh, one of the things we have to understand is that this is a very different and dynamic age. Uh, uh, in 2000, actually the state pension plans were 100% funded, but we know what a, a lot of things happen in the inter, uh, intermediate 12 years. And so we just have to be smart to make sure that we incorporate the risk practices that weren't fully up to date. And frankly, all of America and a lot of international people didn't account for during the dot-com bubble. We have to make adjustments, recognizing that this is a different world. It was easier to invest when the United States was 40% of the world's GDP. We also had a home field advantage. Now we're trying to look at emerging markets that have faster rates of growth, but have higher barriers of entry and greater risk that us, a lot of investors here in America, aren't accustomed to. And so it's, we're going to have some growing pains for the intermediate future. And then when you look at QE3 and what it's going to do to the fixed income portfolio, what it does to inflation, it's going to have an impact on our adjustments to the discount rate. Well, that's very encouraging, John. Um, <laughs> Just good hard work. I know it is. It keeps you employed, too, because there's plenty of problems for a long period of time. 
Um, but I'm going to help you out on, on some of those. I appreciate it. All right. Joel, uh, what do you think about the public pension situation? Uh, what, you know, John knows much more than I do. I, I just think part of the problem is also that our economy isn't growing enough to help make up for it. I mean, there were always, as I understand it, and John, you can correct me, there was an assumption of economic growth would also help yeah. pay for some of these pensions, whether through the stock market or, um, and of course, in terms of the overall budget, I mean, one of the big problems is if you don't have a growing economy, there's no way, I assume in 2000, we had a growing economy, you know, coming out of the Clinton years. And since then, it's been pretty tepid and, or, or worse. It was a decade. Why don't we turn to another audience question. Um, how much can California reduce its energy costs without compromising our environmental consciousness? Energy. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Joel. No. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think the, uh, there's necessarily has to be attention. I mean, first of all, there are a lot of alternative energy sources which we should be developing, not just uh, uh, solar and wind, but also looking at nuclear energy and nuclear fusion with some of the work that's being done at the labs. Secondly, natural gas uh, is, a, is a huge source of energy, and of course that implicates fracking technology, but the latest type, we have to figure out how we can uh, make sure that fracking isn't affecting our drinking water and isn't uh, uh, affecting uh, environmental issues, and, and that technology, in my judgment, can be developed. And I point out to my Republican friends who uh, now extol fracking that it was actually developed in the Department of Energy under the Carter administration. So there is some value to uh, government uh, investment. Well, it's very encouraging to hear a former member of the Obama administration talk about the central role of natural gas. Uh, I can recall uh, the current Secretary of Energy giving a presentation on America's energy future, and there were two words that were never mentioned, and those were natural gas. The key is former. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm on a panel in London that we're holding a London summit in early October with Mayor, former Mayor Daley of Chicago, and he said the same thing. His, his brother was chief of staff. Okay, I won't go there. Um, all right, let's, let's turn to some other more practical questions here. I think this is a good one. In fact, what are some practical steps that you can take in order to continue to make strides towards a more viable economy? Maybe it's the youth, that the youth can take, I believe. It does say youth. Like young people, how do we make the state a more viable economy, regulations? Joel, I know you got plenty of things to complain about that need to be fixed. Let us have them, please. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, well, the great tragedy, of course, is to the young people in the country, and by the way, not only here, I had the cover of Newsweek on the called it the screwed generation, so, um, and I see it with my students, I see very bright, talented young people, and I say, well, what are you gonna do after you graduate? Well, park cars. Um, we've gotta be able to offer something better than that. So there's several things. One, the education system um, is really failing the kids, not giving them the basics. I don't think we ask enough of them on almost every level. And then I think we also force or try to drive too many kids into four-year colleges who would be much better off with two, much better off getting a certificate, much better off getting a skill working in manufacturing or warehousing or, you know, I'll give you an example. I was, um, I was working in the city of Salinas um, quite a bit and the community college had gotten rid of the ag tech program. I mean, this is an agricultural region and so they were having to get their technicians from Arizona or from Mexico or from someplace else. So this sense that everybody's got to get a four-year degree and you, know, and, and you tell me, uh, you know, what's the job prospect of the you know, post-modernist literature graduate from you know, Cal State you know, Monterey Bay? Well, you know, in, in the old days in New York, I'll, I'll age myself right here, uh, saying that in a subway token would get you a ride on the subway. Um, otherwise, we are, we, we are get, raising incredible expectations and at the same time indebting a whole generation with no sense of how are you actually going to take what you get in your education and do something worthwhile with it. So that's certainly one thing. I think that we could do much more in terms of um, 
of creating, and again, I think if you created more manufacturing jobs, more energy jobs, uh, including in natural gas, that would provide enormous opportunities. I'll give you an uh, illustration. Over the last decade, Texas has created over 200,000 energy-related jobs. They tend to pay about the same level as the, as the jobs in high-tech pay, but very broad spectrum from PhD scientists, geologists from Rice, to the guys who are driving the trucks. And they're making really good money um, by abandoning whole sectors that would have created middle class jobs for this young generation. My biggest worry by far is when I you know, ride my bike around LA and I go a little bit east of where I live and I see these young kids, 20, 21, 22, sitting around doing nothing, um, that, scares, that scares me. And I think we have got to really figure out a pathway for those kids who are, particularly those kids who are not likely to develop four year, six year uh, kind of uh, uh, um, po you know, postgraduate and you know, higher education. I think we, you know, we're, we're sending too many kids to college. We're not doing a very good job on the, kid, on the other kids. Um, and we're not providing a, a path for them. And what I've noticed in other states is they've done a really good job of training, like one of the reasons uh, companies go to South Carolina or they go to Alabama or they go to Texas is that there's very good uh, training for blue collar skills in those states. And Tennessee is also another one. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking to go to, uh, I was in Nashville recently, and all the uh, Nissan um, headquarters moving to Nashville and all the, the manufacturing and design jobs that should have been in California, given our ties to the Pacific Rim, naturally here that we've given away. Um, and then you think about all those young people who might have been very happy with, a, with getting a, a good job, paying 80000 as a machinist, and those opportunities are gone. And I don't know who expects our society to exist where 5 10 percent of the population does really well and everybody else does poorly. Ro, you want to jump in here? Please. I, I completely agree with uh, Joel about the importance of having different uh, options, whether that's NIMS credentialing or, or uh, some form of vocational education or college. But I do think we also have to ask young people uh, to do their part and to remember how uh, privileged our, my generation and younger people are. I remember a meeting with Andy Grove uh, a few years back, and he said, you know, you're in government, people your age are out in Afghanistan, you know, do something meaningful. And you look at the generations in this country that have been challenged far more than our generation, whether that was World War II, whether it was the Cold War, whether it was the March of Civil Rights, and now you're telling young people, okay, you've got a lot of competition and people in India and China waking up and studying a lot and uh, working hard, and what you need to do is work hard and study hard and outcompete them. And uh, that is what's gonna make us a great country, and that is the challenge for our generation. So I think it's a combination of the right policies and also challenging young people to say, you know, every generation in this country has done their part to keep America great, and it's incumbent on us to do our part. All right, let's move to a, um, a broader macro question. We touched on a little bit. The impact of QE3, mm -hmm. both long and short term on value of the dollar, the price of oil inflation, and retirement accounts. And if you don't answer the question correctly, I will answer it myself. <laughs> I, I think Peter. Come on, Peter. Uh, what do you think? You're the banker on the panel. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Thanks. You're the uh, evil banker. You know, how low is low? I think that, uh, you know, continuing uh, to support um, uh, different ways to generate um, activity in the economy is a good thing. However, uh, I think we've seen over the years that uh, the devaluation of the dollar is going to be a long-term impact that's going to be tough to recover from, from my uh, position. And, you know, you saw Japan and what happened with interest rates and how they've almost been negative for a number of years, and it really hasn't changed much in their economy. So you struggle to take a look at QE3 and see, is this going to be something that's going to take that next step and allow us to move forward? 
uh, on an economic recovery basis. Our recovery has been very slow as it is, but it has been a recovery. And I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to play one today, but I would look at things like, um, on a long-term basis, is it better to have certain things washed through and re be revalued at a bottom level and let them grow from there than it is to try and artificially stimulate something on a short-term basis. John, what's QE3 going to do on our pension rate of return for our uh, pension funds? Well, I referenced it yeah. a little bit earlier. Obviously, it, 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 it has an impact on the con issues of wages and inflation rate, which we, we calculate uh, every couple of years in terms of determination of the discount rate, and that's been obviously a huge political area of significant disagreement. And in addition, uh, at CalPERS, our fixed income portfolio is little less than 20 percent. The other portfolio is 17 percent. And so obviously we have challenges as to which fi fi fixed income instruments that we're going to look at, you know, the treasuries, the high yield, and everything else. So it's, we're making the adjustments, but it's obviously made it more challenging. Okay, uh, let's move to real estate quickly. We've got a number, a lot of good questions here. Not enough time to answer them all, but let's at least touch on it. Uh, this has been the missing ingredient of California's recovery uh, has been the housing market. As we, most of us that live in Southern California know in the Central Valley, um, we were one of the hardest hem impacted areas of the country, almost as bad as Phoenix and Las Vegas and South Florida. Today, there are still over two million homeowners in the state of California that are underwater on their mortgages. Uh, it was, the, wor the downturn was worst in the central area, the inland areas of the state. But my question really is this, are we at a point where stabilizing prices and record low mortgage rates can spur new home construction. It can benefit the rest of the states, the states of economy. It's been the missing ingredient in the economic recovery. Is how does housing now provide an opportunity for job creation in the state of California? Should we turn to a banker first? You might have done some real estate lending sure. in the past. Uh, look, I, I think that clearly there's still some softness in in the Central Valley specifically on the housing market side. That is still there. It is a tremendous oversupply. Uh, that's where a lot of the, the uh, people are still challenged in, in meeting their mortgage obligations. I would argue that you are seeing a pretty fair recovery, at least in the multifamily home mm -hmm. area here in San Francisco and again down in Los Angeles and Orange County. There's growth that is occurring. There is actual construction that is occurring. Um, you know, the Trinity Towers right down the street here is an example of that, as well as down in Southern California. So the multifamily recovery is, is starting now. Uh, the single family homes, I do believe, specifically in more of the populated areas as well, have stabilized, have started to actually see an uptick in price, and we're, we're continuing to um, see some starts on new home sale, or starts on new homes that we hadn't seen for a number of years in those particular areas. So again, having such a broad state, a big diverse economy within the state, it is going to be very lumpy throughout the state. We're actually seeing um, a significant slowdown in the amount of foreclosures that are occurring in a number of areas as well. Clearly, you know, whether it's us as a financial institution implementing various programs that we have over the last number of years or the HARP program that has come into play, um, you know, there are a number of modification workshops. We've held over 700 modification workshops over the last three years for home mortgages. And I would make a point that, you know, we hear about the troubles that are out there, and yes, there's still a number of homes that are underwater on an equity basis, but 97% of our customers uh, that have mortgages with Wells Fargo are paying as agreed. So you're hearing about the 3% that aren't. And that's what I think is the challenge, because in this economy and what we have today, and what we have today versus what we had in, say, the early 90s when I was in the construction lending group in Southern California for Wells, it's so much easier to get information at your fingertips today than it was then. I mean, I barely had an email address at that time. So today it's a different era. It's, it's communication at your fingertips. It creates 
significant swings in emotion as things occur. And that swing in emotion changes the dynamic as far as whether or not people feel good when they wake up in the morning or don't. And whether or not you know, consumer confidence is there, I can tell you the confidence is gonna be dependent on whether or not you wake up in the morning and feel like I'm readily employed, I feel like I can put food on the table for my family, there's consumer confidence. Anything else outside of that is very challenging. Anybody else on uh, the housing sector in California? Well, is it starting to recover? Well, I think there's definitely um, the single family home market, like in places like Simi Valley, is actually starting to come back. Yeah. Uh, basically, you have areas that, that, A, the vast majority of people, if they have a choice, want a single family home. Uh, if you can find that near employment with good schools, you're in a pretty good long term situation. Um, there are, there are, the big thing is going to be demographics. Right now, we have a whole generation that's waiting to get married, not having kids because they don't see a, a good future as exactly as, as Peter suggested. That's, you know, and it's not that they're moving necessarily into cities, they're in their parents' basement. They're, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the numbers of, of people in their 20s and even 30s living with their parents, that's an enormous uh, depressing effect on the entire economy and certainly on um, on their parents. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I think there are a couple of good things that we can look forward to. The the millennial bulge, in other words, the, what we call the echo boomers, who are now um, beginning to enter their 30s, are beginning to move into that phase where they will eventually get married, have children, want to want to buy a house, you know, not going to be hanging out at the bars every night. Um, so I think that's going. To, that's a positive, and a very big positive for California is the continued um, immigration from Asia, because when we, uh, I just did this analysis um, for Forbes, um, the Asian population in terms of home buying and going into um, uh, particularly suburban areas is just astounding. I mean, it is, it is one of the things that's kept. In a lot of ways, we we've we've got people who either brought money with them or have started businesses. And if you go to a place like Irvine right now, it must be about 40, 45% of the population is now um, Asian. Um, the immigrants are probably, if we have salvation for California, it's gonna come from the immigrants because they'll work harder, they'll work longer, um, and they believe that they wanna save up money in order um, to provide for their children. Um, so I think long term, the immigrant market and the millennials getting older and finally growing up, uh, we hope, um, since I've got one of them, um, is, uh, is, is something that we, I think we, we can look forward to over time to bring the market uh, back. But again, as Peter said, if we don't have significant job growth, um, you can have all the demographics in your favor and uh, people are not gonna buy houses. That's very insightful, Joel. Uh, actually, I have a piece coming out in the Atlantic here in the next month or so where I'm proposing a new program, an immigration program, uh, call it a variation on EB-5, which would essentially say that um, foreigners that want to buy homes in the United States, uh, the first two million that get in line uh, get a green card if they spend only three months of the year here. And I guarantee you, you would have massive amount of Asian purchases, and it would correct the California housing market in no time. Can I say something? You can, John. I, I wanted to think about an EB-5 for public services and to reduce the state's debt. That's interesting. EB-5 for public services. Can I write an op-ed on that one, too, uh, yeah, and claim it myself? Uh, uh, okay. Go for it, as okay. long as we have movement. Okay. I, want to, I want to eliminate debt from the state. Well, as long as we're talking about debt, l let's look a little bit longer term, John. Um, I, I know you've been working on this for many years, but uh, longer term, looking at the California budget, what change would you like to see the, the state make in the way it provides for services and investments? And in other words, in terms of the process of budgeting, what changes do you think could provide a more sound fiscal management structure in the state? Uh, let me just spotlight, put the spotlight on one issue, the, the growing percentage uh, of the state budget of debt service. And so the three largest expenditures for the state are education, 51 to 52 percent of the state budget, and these are general fund dollars, 28 to 29 percent for social services and, and welfare, 
and about 9 to 10% for corrections. Those areas are pretty difficult to change. What's really very disturbing is the percentage increase. So if you look back a few decades, 3% of the state budget was debt service. If you look back four years ago, 4.7%. Debt affordability report from the Treasurer's Office last year, 7.8%. If we issue the authorized uh, debt, then we're going over 10%. We have no flexibility in the state budget. And so we have to simply act and think like investment bankers. We have limited resources. We have to identify what's the highest and best use, what's going to prioritize, and we need Republicans and Democrats to say, we're going to go out in this order, and this is how we're going to handle the state's debt. Very good. Unfortunately, we've reached the point of our program where there's only time for one last question, and I get a chance to ask it. I'm going to change the format a little bit. I'm going to ask you each the same question as opposed to different questions. What do you see ahead for California's economy relative to the United States over the next year? And what would you say is the biggest risk to the outlook? And Peter, <coughs> since we're picking on bankers, I'm going to turn to you first. Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, again, we've, we've touched on it a number of times. The, the economic climate in, in California, there has been some growth. There has been, you know, 15 percent of, of the national growth in jobs has occurred in California. That's a great number. And what we represent 12 percent of the population. Right. So what, it, what, but what is that job growth and what are those areas that the job growth is in? Is it sustainable long term? I think that the challenge that we face in California is, is again, focused in on the ability to do work in California, the challenge of the economic cost of doing business in California. Um, there have been a number of clients that I've worked with over the last 24 months. Now, they do have a national presence. They're privately held companies, but they have chosen to leave the state of California, move to, to Texas. Their argument can simply be, well, I can fly two hours east and two hours west. It's so much easier to touch my national presence. But if they're happy and able to provide for their employees and their employees feel like they're getting a return for their investment in California, perhaps that move doesn't occur. So I think that there is a long-term challenge that we face. How uh, viable is it for someone that is going to be earning $80,000 a year? Where can they locate their home? How far away from their office? How far is their commute in order to attain that and achieve an econo economic lifestyle that they're used to? There's a challenge, and I think that that's going to be a challenge not just next year, but for the years to come. John, you're looking at those uh, monthly cash statements. What's it telling us about the California economy? Uh, the, uh, we're, we're seeing it improve, uh, but it's, it's volatile and it's not strong. Uh, so any risk out there can just shock the system and the, really hurt us. Uh, I want to highlight one issue. It's not the biggest risk factor, but something that I think we need to have more discussion, and we certainly need more discussion by policymakers to make sure that we don't damage, further damage our California financial ecosystem, and that's the municipal bankruptcies. Yeah. Well, that, that's enough. Uh, that's a subject for an entire discussion. We maybe won't do that in the next 30 seconds. Uh, Ro, what do you think? What's ahead for California the next year or so? Well, I think if you look at the fundamentals of the state, we have, again, a lot of resources. We've got the, some of the smartest people from the world. We have some of the smartest, best universities. We have some of the best community colleges. We, we, sh we have an entrepreneurial culture. We have extraordinary creativity. The question is, can we get our policies right to support this? And uh, there was a uh, quote which I, uh, applied to America, Richard McGregor, who said, the problem with America is not that it needs to be more like China. The problem with America is it needs to be more like America. The uh, same can be said for California. There used to be a time where we did education investment correctly, where we had uh, community colleges and vocational education, where we had infrastructure, where we had Republicans and Democrats coming together on a business climate. You know, the, the, the policy, we need to get the policy right, and then I think the state will uh, flourish. Very good. Joel, you get the uh, last word other than my last word. Okay. Uh, basically, the first thing is um, my father was a physician. Um, the first thing you got to do is know what your condition is and, and be very, very frank about where things are at. As long as we keep deluding ourselves that high-speed rail or green jobs or social media are going to save us, 
because the media being the way they are um, will jump on it. Um, we first have to say how deep is our problem. Then we have to come up with a, uh, a program to sort of say how do we get out of it. The, the one great thing I'd like to see, which I didn't see, is and I worked with this with Willie Brown and John Vasconcellos um, in the 90, early 90s. We had a horrible recession, um, in many ways worse than this one. And the, there was a willingness to sit down and say, we know we have problems, can we fix them? And until we get that willingness among people to sit down and say, how do we work this out? And this was when Peter Uberoth was involved. Yeah. Uh, I was involved in that effort myself personally. Uh, we're not going to solve our problems. The so first thing is understand what your problems are. And second of all, there's got to be some sort of decision on the part of the political leadership to say, we're going to solve this problem irrespective of party, as Firo LaGuardia, my favorite Republican socialist, said. Um, uh, you know, you, there's no Republican or Democratic way to sweep the streets. <laughs> well, maybe that's the best way to wrap up this panel. We'll sweep it under the carpet. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank our panelists, John Chung, controller of the state of California, Peter Griebley, executive vice president, commercial banking for Wells Fargo, Joel Kotkin, a distinguished presidential fellow in urban futures at Chapman, and Ro Khanna, visiting lecturer, in the Department of Economics at Stanford University and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the Obama administration. Um, we'd like to thank our audiences here and on the radio, television, and the internet. This program has been part of the Commonwealth Club's California Innovation Series, underwritten by Chevron Corporation. And I'd also like to remind everyone that books written by two of our panelists, Joel Kotkin and, and Ro Khanna, uh, will be for sale in the lobby, and both gentlemen have agreed to sign those copies uh, immediately following this program. I'm Ross Duvall of the Milken Institute, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place to be in the know, is adjourned. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs>